actually through it. Um, if there are existing pipeline structures, which I say do, do transport a small amount of gas, that will run from northern Iran through eastern Turkey and into the Turkish grid, and they go a little bit into the European grid, but that, that relationship between the Turkish grid and the European gas grid, Western European gas grid, is about to get much bigger as the plan, the plan will go ahead. Now, so there's no physical constraint on movement, or technical constraint on the movement of Iranian gas through into uh, the only real uh, constraint is essentially is a political one. Sanctions and all the concerns both in the US and in Europe about uh, trade with Iran. If, if those were things were to evaporate overnight, then they'd probably build a much bigger pipeline with bigger capacity um, running the same route. But they could still do it easily. And uh, I would think that the, 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 there's a very good likelihood that that, will, that gas will, there are major forces that will try to push that gas towards Europe. Whether that will be this side of any shift in the political structures in Iran uh, or not is another question. I mean, whether or not there had to be a political change in Iran before that happens is a question. We're all old enough to know that yesterday's enemy could turn into our new friend, despite the fact that our um, has actually you know, changed that. Um, uh, you know, that we've, we've all been there on that. So, it's quite possible for actually us to decide what well, around us and to change, but we will import this very much. But that is a, a slightly and the, other And the Syria could damage Iran? I mean, is that why everybody's fighting there? They're allies. Oh. Well, they're, they're allies. Okay. Yeah, they're the closest allies, so they really help each other a lot. They're like their own axis of power, and they're, they're facing a lot of enemies in the area and out against the Saudis and... Yeah, yeah I mean, that's the main geopolitical dichotomy in the area, right? It's the Saudis and the Iranians. Uh, and the Saudis back with Syrian rebels and the Iranians back with Assad. Um, Saudis would like a Sunni and sympathetic government in Syria aligned with them rather than aligned with the with the Shia and the Iraq. Yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you for your presentation. I appreciate it the beginning of the person story. This woman and her family and then at the end a uh, further more uh, optimistic things <laughs> but, but my question is more uh, do you think that there's going to be major changes on our use of you know, fossil fuels. Is it people going to choose that? I know there's a group campaigning for that. There are a number of intentional communities right around Travisville. But it seems to me the average person is very content with their way of life now and doesn't want it to be interfered with. And uh, so uh, if a change is coming, they're going to be forced on people necessity or are they going to choose intelligent to do so? What do you think of that? It's a heavy question. No, it's a very interesting question. How does the change come? It's a very interesting question. I think it can I, I think that it comes both through people wanting to do something. I already articulated how a lot of people have changed their view and they want to change in, 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 a, in a transition times movement is a good thing. And the other side is being forced to change. But force is an interesting question. We tend to think of governments forcing us to do things. Or, um, um, when we talk about politics, we tend to think about, or social things, we tend to think about governments forcing us to do things, or uh, um, you know, money, uh, banks forcing us to do things. But in our, in our own personal lives, we include something much more important than that, which is circumstance forces to change things. Many of the things that I've changed in my life uh, fall down to what I would call circumstance. And what is circumstance? Circumstance is a rather nebulous term applied to lots and lots of different events which are outside my control, but I have to navigate them. 
And I would say that there will be radical shifts in the energy structures, partly through changes in circumstance. And, I, and that's not just a, a guess, but it's also uh, a reality. Uh, you know, I, I see it in my own life. The thing that m most shifted energy structures in the UK for a period of time before they split back the other way was the oil crisis of 74, 73, 74. Enormous hike in oil prices there. My father did something absolutely unthinkable. He went out and bought a bicycle. I never saw him ride it, but he went out and buy a bicycle. Which, if you knew my dad, that would be, you'd be amazed. Um, and, and, and there was a big shift in, the, in, in people's thinking about where does our energy come from? And I believe it happened here a bit as well. Now, it was then pushed aside after President Carter had told us to wear another jersey or something. Um, but, uh, but there was a big shift. And I personally think the chances, if you said to me, are we going to get to 2025 20, okay, without a radical hike in the price of oil at some point between that time and now, I, I would say, uh, I wouldn't take that bet with you. I think we, they will go through radical oil spikes. And of course there's a debate about peak oil, but most of oil spikes are generally created by political shifts, political crises. And I think what is interesting is that those political crises give us the opportunity to make force of creating that circumstance that changes something. And my final point of, uh, um, of circumstance that changes is that I mentioned about Bavaria and the, and the shift of, um, of fossil, away from fossil fuels in Bavaria. One of the most important agents in that shift was the US Air Force. It's the US Air Force that bombed uh, the German um, oil production system at the end of the Second World War into oblivion. And what that did, as they had done at the same at the end of the First World War, is that it meant that basically when the Allies won, they said that Germany, which there were many, many options of what they were going to do with Germany, but one of the things they said to Germany is that you are not going to have an oil, uh, oil company. You're not going to have an oil industry. And as a result of that, name me the large, world's largest oil company that's based in Germany. There isn't one. There's a big one in France, there's a big one in Italy, there's a big one in the UK, there's a big one in uh, um, uh, um, Spain, there's a big one in the Netherlands, there's a big one in, in the US. Where's the big one in Germany? And where's the big one in, in Japan? Why are both those countries the most significant countries driving forward not other forms of fuel? Okay, Japan went down the nuclear route, but it might not necessarily do that anymore. Um, but it, those circumstances change things. So I, I, I say those... They have the most those efficient economies, they have the most energy efficient yeah. economies. Yeah, so all praise the US Air Force, but I didn't say that in this context. No. Some, some people may know there's an event in Charlottesville in 15 days at which people are going to learn how easy and profitable it is to put solar panels on your roof. Uh, and there are people pushing that kind of event and other people learning from it. And if you <laughs> sign up on this clipboard, you'll be on the email list to get event info. Um, um, James, I think you should go on all night if you're inclined, but there may be people who want to buy books, so at some point you may want to... Well, um, I'm, I'm happy to get, keep it chewing up. If you want to buy a book, you're welcome to do that. I need to... Uh, my host is taking me, uh, burying me away at, uh, at uh, sort of quarter to nine, but I'm very, very happy to um, carry on. If anybody's got some further questions, come on. Well, I, I have been looking at putting solar panels. We're going to put solar panels on our house. We already have a solar hot water system. But I didn't put it together until your presentation. And I'm a smart person. I didn't put it together what a peace building initiative it is to install solar. Because it, it Gets in the it, it gets in the way both of the of the of the oligarchy and the war profiteer simultaneously, and I never understood that yeah, so clearly. That solar panel man is a peace sign. It is. It's absolutely crucial. Can I just say also, just in a short response to you to your thing, to your question, what people desire is mobility. 
they don't necessarily desire a gasoline-powered car. You know, in other in other countries uh, and in other societies, people get you know a lot of their mobility, and certainly in the big cities, they get a lot more of their mobility through transit, which is far more efficient. And you know, as and I believe, you know, we could be getting our mobility via the private vehicle either far more efficiently or with alternative fuels, i.e. electricity or biofuels or some of the things thereof. And we, you know, those technologies are here, they're here today, they're not necessarily, they're not technologies of the future. And that, you know, I think what will happen over time, will, you know, there's no one silver bullet technology, there will be, uh, you know, as we, as we realize more and more that oil is both you know, destroying our atmosphere, but also um, corrupting and, and in, in, in uh, you know, destroying our economy. That we will use less and less of it through a through a through a, uh, a combination of strategies. And part of that is investing in infrastructure to move people uh, without uh, uh, private motor vehicles. And part of that is switching private motor vehicles to uh, a, a combination of alternative sources of oil. It will take time, particularly in this country. Um, but it is happening, in, you know, uh, to a certain extent. You know, American oil consumption peaked in 2005. Um, American uh, vehicle miles travelled. You know, the amount of miles travelled in a vehicle in the, in the United States peaked uh, in about 2007, 2008. Basically, when the price of oil started to really go up. Uh, public transit in America is is booming. It's, it's hard to see that sometimes in some of the smaller cities, but uh, in the big cities of America, public transport is going through a huge resurgence. Um, so I think there are sort of signs of optimism there on, on that story, but for sure we've got a long way to go. Sorry, you have another question? <laughs> Just, um, I just want to surely um, invite everyone in the room. I'm going to go meet with uh, our member of Congress, Robert Hurt, tomorrow at noon, and I would love to not be the only one there. And I'm going to call tomorrow morning and ask that the uh, that, this, that, that, that they give us an answer about the congressman's position, and also that he take our comments in person. It's the most impactful thing we can do to support the Syrian people. But we did that. Yes, we. This is, this is the, my third, oh, really? this is my third visit. Wow. So yeah, it's not time to it's not time to give to. It's, it doesn't hurt at all to be persistent. And on the 25th, it's going to be a great party. It's going to be the best party of the month at Piedmont for solar power. And every nonprofit in town can get solar on your roof um, for, an affordable, for an affordable rate. Because people will just pay the monthly, the monthly uh, charge for electricity. And the banks will own the solar panels. So um, got a great deal going on on the 25th at Piedmont. And tomorrow at noon, that's 686 Berkmar Circle, correct? Ryo and Berkmar. Um, yeah. It's, yeah, it's easy to get to Hertz office. And I'd be glad, speaking of cars, I can't ride my bike there, but I can carpool with you if you need a ride to the congressman's office. Thank you. All right. I think we should give Jack a round.